Hello, Vikings land. Welcome back to another episode of Two Old Bloggers. This is your host, Dave, and I'm here with my partner, Darren. We've got an action pack episode for you today with a hot topic that I'm sure to ignite some discussion in all of you. It's Jaron Hall time, and we're here to dissect it. In today's episode, we'll be delving deep into the rise of rookie Jaron Hall. I don't know if we call it a rise, but he's been named the starter, replacing Nick Mullins. Why now? What led to the decision? Does this young player have what it takes to lead the Vikings? We'll explore all these questions and more providing you with our insights and analysis on this significant development. And of course, we have over two decades apiece writing publicly and commenting publicly on your Minnesota Vikings, so we have an opinion or two. But that's not all. The Vikings have been facing a challenging time with a stream of unfortunate injuries affecting key players like DJ Wanham and TJ Hawkinson. How will these absences impact the team's performance in the remainder of 2023? And how could they potentially affect the roster buildup in 2024? We'll dive into these issues, discussing the long-term effects and potential strategies that the team might adopt in response. Next, we gear up for the much anticipated Vikings versus Packers game. FGB. Given the recent changes and the current direction of the Vikings, what can we expect from this division clash? Will the change in quarterback position affect the Vikings' chances to win at U.S. Bank Stadium? Will Jaron Hall seize the day? We'll take an in-depth look at the game and the potential scenarios, discussing some player performances, strategic moves, and much, much more. From the potential of Josh Oliver and K.J. Osborne to the team's offensive success and pass protection strategies, we're going to leave no stone unturned. Whether you're a diehard fan or a casual follower of the Vikings, this episode is a must for you. So get comfortable, tune in, and join our conversation as we navigate the exciting world of your Minnesota Vikings. Remember, your thoughts and opinions matter to us, so don't hesitate to join in the discussion. Let's get started with two old bloggers. Let's rock. Vikings First and Skull presents This Week in Vikings Land with Darren and Dave, your two old bloggers. <laughs> and we're back as Darren ducked off camera real quick. <clears throat> but, hey, Darren, how are things in the great white north? Are you back above the Arctic Circle? I am. Got back Thursday evening. I uh, was uh, traveling, did some driving down to northern Alberta for, spent about a week there. Came back Thursday, all smooth sailing, all back in my regular studio, regular digs, regular sound system. So things are good. How about you, Dave? Hey, what? sitting here down in southern Texas, drinking whiskey, eating good food, and having a good time, watching a ton of football. And we've yeah. got football this weekend. It's going to be interesting to see how our team fares. But first, we named this Jaron Hall time because the big news of the week was the Vikings named Jaron Hall the starter for this weekend. 
which I think is a good thing. There's been a bunch of us that have been uh, claiming and talking loudly that we want to see what the kids got. So now we're going to get our chance. And that brings us to theme one. Up next. <laughs> As uh, Kevin Seifert wrote this week, the Vikings quarterback carousel continues. Uh, <laughs> so, you, you know, if, if you... Uh, first thing, Viking fans, you have been heard. For all of those, like our Justin Day, who've been calling for, for Kevin O'Connell to start Jaron Hall for several weeks now, he finally did it. Thursday, they announced Hall is going to take the start over Nick Mullins. <laughs> <laughs> and Darren has discovered his soundboard buttons. Yeah, I finally decided to use some of these suckers. See how they go. So, yeah. Um, and, and, again, a lot of people... Justin Day calling for it, seen it lots of times uh, over the past several weeks, and it's finally happened. Oh, Dave, you're getting oh, oh there you go. You're back. Norman, uh, you, I you saw the Norse feeds but, and it made me yeah. shrink. Um, yeah, <laughs> but um, but it, but but you you know that the last week on the show, uh, I we talked about can Nick Mullins play winning football for the Vikings as a starting quarterback, and what we saw on last Sunday against Detroit was a definitive no. <laughs> no, no, Nick Mullins cannot play winning court, uh, winning football for the Vikings. Uh, he threw four interceptions, uh, could have been four, five or six, really. And, um, and even if you, you know, explain away, you know, well, and he, and he threw six interceptions in his two starts, uh, did lots of other good things. Uh, but, you know, the six interceptions, even if you ex kind of explain away, some a couple of those saying, well, he was unlucky here, or the ball bounced off somebody's hands there. That's still way too many interceptions for a quarterback in the NFL today to be throwing to really for you to consider that Nick Mullins gives the Vikings the best chance to win. Um, so <laughs> I support, not, believe it or not, and uh, since the stat EPA came about and I think it was pro football focus that was using it and measuring it. He is only the second quarterback ever to throw four interceptions and still have a positive EPA. Mm. Well, he, he did lots of good things. Like he yep. pushed the ball down the field. Uh, the I think target was great. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you look over, his two two starts. Well, if you count the the Raiders game as well, he almost completed seventy percent of his passes. Over those two games, he threw over seven hundred yards. That was the most passing yardage of any quarterback over those two weeks. But again, when you're averaging three to four in, uh, turnovers per game, that's just something that teams cannot overcome. San Francisco 49ers found that out against the Baltimore Ravens uh, on uh, you know last week as well. Yeah, and so I support. Yeah. Why do you support what? Yeah. Sorry. Well, I, you know, I, I completely support the decision, the KOC's decision to go to Hall at this point. Um, you, you know, uh, people might remember Bruce Arians, uh, former Tampa Bay Buccaneers um, coach, um, offensive coordinator for the Pittsburgh Steelers, um, interim head coach for the Colts for a time. You know, he had that saying, I'm sure a lot of people remember it, is that no risk it, no biscuit. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of truth to that. If, if you've got a quarterback who's too careful, doesn't take chances, sometimes you got to throw the ball to your guy, even if he looks like he's covered. Sometimes you got to throw the ball deep, even though it looks like there might be double coverage to a guy like Justin Jefferson because you think that he can win. Sometimes you got to throw the ball where no, where you think the guy's going to be into tight windows. You got to take some of those chances. But so, but it was pretty clear that Nick Mullins is a no risk it, no biscuit kind of guy. The problem is, is that uh, you know we just saw he's get way, through way too many, made too many, way too many risky decisions throwing the ball uh, during his three his his two games starting. And he made kept, continued to make some like real mind-numbing brain fart decisions, like 
the second time in two weeks where he's getting sacked, going down, and he somehow thinks that throwing the ball blindly is the right thing to do. And this is a, a veteran from six years, like we saw in Detroit when he got sacked. Luckily, his butt was down. He got ruled uh, down by contact. But that that was like, just take the sack, Nick. <laughs> There's nothing good that can come of this if you try to throw the ball. So there was those kind of things that he just – that just seems to be in his nature. He can't get him, get him out of. And, you know, the, the problem with Nick Mullins, I think, is that uh, he was getting most of the biscuits were going to the opposing team instead of <laughs> through his risky. <laughs> hey, they weren't going to, to the, the Vikings. If you think about it, if he could clear that up, he'd be a great quarterback. His oh, exactly. ADOT was over 10 yards per pass. It's just he was – Unbelievably productive in that way, but he takes it all away with the bonehead plays that he does, and it's it's a shame. It is. It's a shame, and uh, got to give Nick Mullins credit, though, Dave. He got asked this week uh, about this, and he basically and he said just flat out, "I understand. I totally get it." I, you know, it's pretty cut and dry with me. If I, if I'm turning over the ball over that much, I'm not going to be in the game. So I understand why they did it. I agree with it. I felt I let the team down. I thought that was, you know, as good a way as Nick Mullins could have handled the situation because he's got to be extremely disappointed because yeah, he did a lot of very good things out there. The Vikings offense was, you know, looked pretty good a lot of times with him there. But again, just, you can't, when you, you turn the ball over that much, you just, not the positives just can't overcome you know the three or four interceptions you're throwing per game and a couple of the fumbles that he had that luckily got recovered by the Vikings or you know that that sort of thing so mm-hmm. uh I'm just you know give, I'll give credit to Mullins and that but I'm just fed up with quarterbacks who are turning over the ball <laughs> like multiple times per game right now and right now I'm looking for and I hate to say it I never thought I would say it is that I'm just looking for a game manager quarterback who's not going to turn the ball over right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, th- that's what it's come down to, Dave. And, and is Jaron Hall going to be that guy? Um, we'll see. I think what's been clear, though, is that, again, uh, supporting Kevin O'Connell's decision here, I think it's the right move. It's the right move for a few reasons. Uh, one is that, um, y- y- you know, I, I think – for Hall, this is this is the time your your, your playoff your playoff hopes are hanging by a thread. Uh, but really, we've seen that they're not going to get any better. They're not going to be improved any. I think, but with Nick Mullins in the game or Josh Dobbs in the game, because they're turning the ball over way too much. Um, so you know, again, negating a lot of the good things that you're doing. Uh, I think with Hall, the, the the positives, like some of the 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 pluses to starting him now, is that. You got him in a game where it still means something for the Vikings. It still means a lot for the for the that team from Wisconsin. And so this is a game that is going to be high pressure, and you're going to be able to see how Jaron Hall reacts to it. Uh, the highs, the lows. How is he going to adjust to what the Packers do to him defensively? Um, and you know, can and those sorts of things. And so that's it's a great again a great. A development opportunity for him as a pro. I think to be thrust into a game. Uh, with playoff implications and 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 in that case so that's good i think the another the positive is that it gives it's going to give in a meaningful game it's going to give kevin o'connell west phillips the whole offensive staff uh, game tape data on jaron hall to see again uh, how does he react to you got to think that the that that team from wisconsin is going to throw the kitchen sink at jaron hall Sunday night, uh, blitzes, pressures, coverages, the whole shebang. Again, uh, how does he react to that? Does he adjust? What kind of decisions does he, does he make? Does he make wise decisions? Does he, do, you know, how does he read the coverages? Does he throw the right people at the right times at the right places? Uh, that'll all give them again data that they can use next year to see, hey, does this guy have the ability to potentially be a starting quarterback for us sometime? in the future for the Vikings, or at least does he have the ability, look like he has the ability to be a, a good, solid, competent backup, a guy that maybe he's not going to be your starter, but if you need to bring him in a game, he can win you a game and, and, and perform well. Uh, I think that, that this is valuable game tape in the final two games or however long the, the Viking season lasts that again, Kevin O'Connell is going to be given, Wes Phillips is going to be given on Jaron Hall. So there's a lot of pluses there. Um, 
And I think another thing, just schematically, or I guess it's strategy wise, um, Jaron Hall is pretty much a complete unknown as a pro quarterback. So the Packers defense, they're not going to know, I think, really have a great idea about what does Hall do well that we got to take away? What are his weaknesses that we've got to exploit? Uh, so I think that element of surprise, that element of unknown may help the Vikings Sunday night, at least for a quarter or two until, and then the game, get, they get in the flow and the, the Packers might figure some things out. But the element of surprise could be a good thing here. Um, I, you know, is Hall going to perform better than Josh Hobbs or Nick Mullins did? Um, I think that it's quite debatable to to make that conclusion, and we'll get into that more in the game preview. But really, what I've seen from Mullins and Dobbs is that they aren't going to get it done for you either. So bring in Hall uh, at this point in time, it, it, you know. And Dave, love to hear your thoughts on that too, because I know you got him. Although I think I know where you're heading on this as well. Hey, he was drafted to be a Josh Dobbs for uh, or you know, a Mullins to develop into a backup quarterback, hopefully a better one, uh, maybe yeah. not as strong in some areas and stronger in others, like not turning the ball over, being a game manager, right? He's what I consider relatively small at 6'1". Um, that's what he was brought in to be as a fifth rounder. Now he's being thrust into the spotlight to be able to Take that magical step. If he can take that magical step like a certain Tom Brady did way back when or Dak Prescott or any of your late-round quarterbacks that have actually taken the step and moved up, that's good for him. That's And it would be great for the Vikings if he does. We don't know. He only had 13 pass attempts playing in a little over, well, not even two full games. He came in after Cousins got hurt. And that was, you know, straight off the bench, wide-eyed, and then he started the next game, and that lasted all of two series. So there is, you're right. There is not a, much, a lot of tape on him. There is, uh, when we get in, we'll get into some of the stats about him a little bit later, but it's, it's going to be interesting to see, and I think putting him in right now is the correct move because, like you said, either Dobbs or Mullins, are turnover machines, unfortunately. They both have their ups and downs, upsides to them. Mullins, he's he's gunning it over 10 yards every pass. Boom, 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 boom. He's going downfield. Right now in the defense last week sort of dictated that. They played in base. The way to beat base is you go deep. So they helped dictate that, but that's what he did. And 85% of the plays were fine. He was successful at it. It's the other bunch that drives us all crazy. Dobbs, on the other hand, uh, when things are clicking, he's going well. And he always could run, which was a good thing. I like that about Hall. Hall has the ability to run as well. So it's going to be an interesting... Hall may not be have his top qualities as either Mullins or Dobbs, but if he has a mixture and they're all adequate... You know, whether it be running the ball or passing the ball without turning it over, not making bozo stupid mistakes, I'm all for it. Let's get haul the ball. And, you know, we'll work. We'll see what happens in the next two games. We could be eliminated by the time this game starts when it comes to the playoffs. Because if Seattle mm -hmm. wins, yeah, if Seattle and the Rams both win, we are eliminated before the game starts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And, uh, so if one of them loses, we've got a chance, but then we got to win. Now, yes. right now we're sitting at seven and eight. We're playing the Packers at seven and eight. And both have slight, barely playoff chances to make. Vikings are better if uh, they went out, but they need help with Seattle and the Rams. We'll see how it goes, and maybe he takes us into the playoffs. That would be a heck of a story. I would love to be telling that story. But if not, he still may win the last two games or not, and uh, we still not make the playoffs, and we have a better draft position, but we get better view of how he plays in the big game. Now we're going to be getting into theme two, 
which will affect him is how Big this time. this is all these injuries have racked up. So with all these injuries, you know, piled up, he's not going to be thrown to, you know, the starters across the board. He's not going to have all of them because we don't have all of them, unfortunately. And there's some are questionable for tomorrow. Others are out. We'll, we'll get into that here momentarily. Um, Chuck says, yep, need a loss. Crazy season. Yeah, I didn't think if... Seattle or LA lost or both won tomorrow that we were still I thought we were still in it supposedly no that will eliminate us because of, of the tiebreakers but who who knows I could be wrong I've been wrong before but let's win yeah. let's just go win and yeah. you know and the reason for winning is because puck the fackers as usual. But we'll get into that too. Team three. I have never been able to enthusiastically root for the Vikings to lose, no matter what was mm -hmm. the draft position that was up for grabs or whatever. It's just not in me. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's hard. But on to theme two. We're going to talk about the mass unit that was this last week. Yeah, Detroit. The Detroit game was costly, not just to our playoff hopes, but uh, just the amount of injuries we had in that game. And it's been a season of injuries, Dave's, like you referenced in the opener. But um, last week, not only do we have because of that game, not only is um, Jordan Addison questionable for tomorrow's game and Makai Blackman questionable for tomorrow's game and we just learned that Troy Dye special teamer has been put on injured reserve uh, all, he was questionable with a wrist injury I guess things got a lot serious in the past 24 hours but and, you know those injuries happened and then but also you lost DJ Wanham to a partially torn quad he's done for the season you lost TJ Hawkinson with a tore MCL and an ACL done for the season and those are pretty you know tough tough dev devastating losses tough losses for the vikings because uh, not only did they obviously they're going to impact the final two games or however long the viking season goes in 2023 but i think they also could alter quasi dofa mensa's draft plans in 2024 um you know just looking at tj hawkinson let's get to that first okay so you know here's a guy he's leading the team in receptions 95 receptions leading the team in receiving yards 960 yards and a real damn shame that he's out because he's only 45 yards away from beating joe Sensor's record for most receiving yards in a season for a vikings tight end and he would he would have got it easily probably mm -hmm. in, the, in the game against the packers so really tough there tough for our offense because you know let's look there is nobody nobody on the Vikings tight end unit now that is anywhere close to TJ Hawkinson in kind of the receiving threat that he is um, and, and has been uh, Josh Oliver is, you know, he, coming out of San Jose state in his final senior season before he went to the draft, he caught a lot of passes, but in the pros, he's basically been an extra offensive lineman. And, and and blocking, 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 catching the occasional pass like he did in that play against Detroit, which was sweet. <laughs> but uh, also one that Nick Mullins did not throw as an interception, so that was good. But uh, but so does he have something more to give as a wide receiver, as a receiving threat um, at the tight end position? Well, I guess we're going to find out. Johnny Munt is your third, you know, third tight end, has yep. always been and always will be. Um, and the best you know, third that's tight fine. end in the league, according to yeah, Coach right, O'Connell. Right. Yeah, well, best third tight end on our team, I guess. Uh, who <laughs> also used to play for the Rams, which seems to be very important. So, <laughs> uh, Vix, I, I did. I want to. He, he said the hit on TJ Hogginson was dirty. I I disagree. Uh, I would love it if he hadn't got hit low because he wouldn't be out. But I think in a fast paced game. Uh, you got a small, def smaller defensive back trying to hit a big tight end. What are guys going to do? Down. They always go low <laughs> like a lot of times. And it's just unfortunate the helmet hit him in the knee where it did. Uh, so I don't think it was dirty. 
but uh, if I were, do I wish he would have tried to hit him more in the midsection? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Or but down at the ankles? Yeah, yeah. But now I'm curious because he hit him in the knee. Not that that the hit necessarily did the damage. I mean, it did the damage, but what caused it was his foot stuck in the turf, mm. and then the hit bending the knee backwards. I'm wondering with next year's new turf, and we'll probably do a show on that later, um, if that's going to help or if it, it would have happened on grass, even, the way he got hit. And uh, and, it, and it very well could have. That's just the way things happen. Yeah. Um, I guess getting back to the Vikings, getting back to the Vikings tight end room without Hawkinson, you know, Oliver Munt, and then the other guy that we have is Nick Muse. Well, um He's a guy that he looked, he did had some, uh, some strong, um, I thought encouraging moments in preseason, caught some, he made some nice catches, was an, was a, like a threat, was probably our best receiver receiving threat during the preseason. But that was August, excuse me, against backups and guys that aren't in the NFL anymore. Uh, and so he has yet to be active for a game this season. The Vikings have played 15 so far. He will be active on Sunday, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so maybe he has more to give. Uh, you know, I think he'll get a, he'll get a shot over the final two games. But and he's obviously still, caught balls from Hall. Yes, Jaron Hall. Jaron Hall. So they have a little connection, which may may help Muse, may help Hall, may help the Vikings' offense. That familiarity. But uh, out of those three, not really a very robust. Like there's nobody there that I think is like an emerging, like a young uh, protege to Hawkinson who has like real pass receiving juice, as far as we know. Unless Oliver shows something here, uh, and I think that that's going to really, I think, with with T.J. Hawkinson, you you mentioned it, Dave. The, the comeback, uh, the recovery period, according to the Mayo Clinic, from a torn ACL is 9 to 12 months. For so NFL best- players. Yeah. That's yeah. for NFL players. It's longer for regular humans. So, so uh, best case scenario is that Hawkinson, the nine months one, is Hawkinson's back probably by second or third game of the regular season in, in September. Uh, worst case scenario is that he's not back until de- late December, basically missed the entire season. And so I think that that's going to really, that reality and who we've got in the tight end room right now is really going to alter uh, Kwesi Adolfo Menses. Like he's going to have to, I think, target in potentially, potentially in the draft, a tight end a lot earlier uh, than he was planning to. He may not have been planning. You never know, but he probably, mm-hmm. tight end was going to be high on our wish list, I think, in, in next April's draft. But now when you got Hawkinson sitting out, potentially out for as long as he is, I think that changes could change quite a bit unless they pick up somebody else in free agency. But that I think that really clouds the tight end position. And and then so that's Hawkinson. I think that's serious enough. DJ Wanham getting injured. Um again, I think that really impacts both of those things, our short term and long term for, for the Vikings, because here is a guy that sound like Collinsworth there, but here's a guy. <laughs> but but uh you know he he'd had a pretty he was having a very strong, solid season. Eight sacks, tied for his career high. Thirty-three, uh, in, you know, solo tackles. Six passes defensed, uh, and uh, he was really uh, like a, had proved to be a pretty solid complement to Daniel Hunter as an edge rusher. Well, now he is gone. Uh, you've only got Hunter. That leaves, I think, pretty much with we want him out. Uh, it might not have been such a big deal if Marcus Davenport was available to play. Who? But. Yeah, who? Who's that guy? But Davenport, even though apparently he's walking quite fine, now uh, is in no hurry to get back in a uniform, uh, which shake shake our heads, but that's what we're hearing. So Davenport isn't available. Yeah, Probably he's isn't walking fine, but he doesn't feel good enough or whatever to play yeah. football. That, hey, that pure 13 percent attitude. So he Lord is fans. not... Warned us about it. That's true. He, he's not going to be back for the regular season no. either. And so you basically, how are the Vikings going to get any pass rush with Daniel Hunter uh, being the only guy there? The best healthy pass rusher right now besides Hunter is Josh Metellus, <laughs> in, in my mind. Who's, who's <laughs> um, so I think, you know, really, and, and oh, you saw last week how, how like ahead. really like, 
Anyway, but but last week, like how the Vikings going to get any pass rush on the Packers or the next week against Detroit? We saw last week how Goff kind of carved them up. They had a hard time getting off the field, didn't get a lot of pressure on them, and that was with Wanham in the game. So you don't have Hunter. Uh, it's gonna, I, it'd be really interesting to see how Brian Flores manufactures pressures without Wanham in there as an extra guy. One guy who could emerge, who's going to get a shot, is Pat Jones the, the second, uh, Dave. Uh, I thought he had his best game he ever had as a Viking um, on last Sunday. He got his first sack of the season. He had another pressure, which ended up being that like that unbelievably bad pass, roughing the passer call. No way that was roughing the passer. And he had I, I counted three nice tackles um, on on running plays. A couple, one for a loss. Uh, his PFF grades was still poor at forty seven point three, but I think that was a game where they they didn't do very well, but. You know, Jones is a guy where I think he's like the worst or second worst rated edge rusher PFF has all season. But I thought he had a good game. Now he's going to get a chance to, in the final two games, he's probably going to be the guy starting opposite Wanham. Uh, he's going to get a chance to show what he can do. I don't know there? if he's going to do. Andre Carter yes, would be the only I forgot guy. Andre uh, Carter. Uh, uh, I probably expect guy. him to be active this weekend. He will, and he was active last week, but he was just playing in special teams. Okay. Uh, he'll certainly get more snaps, but but Jones is a guy who's going to get a shot. Now, will he be effective? I'm not really holding my breath because even the worst players have a good game every once in a while, Dave. Uh, mm -hmm. And and he's really been like invisible all season except for that game against Detroit. Uh, but so 2023, not so visible good. Visible on those plays, but according to PFF, yeah. invisible on yeah. the other plays. Oh yeah, overall not not a, a poor game. Um, twenty twenty four again, long term. You know, Wanham is a guy with the way he's played, uh, better than he you know, and he he thrived under in Brian Flores' defense this year. I feel he's a guy where Quasi Adolfomense again, as you're looking at, might have been targeted to re-sign for probably would have been a you know a fairly reasonable extension. Uh, which is something Kwesi Adolfo Mensa likes. All general managers like that. But now you got a partially torn quad coming up, a pretty serious injury. That, again, that has to be taken into consideration when you're looking at resigning a guy. And I think, again, looking at the Vikings roster, if you don't bring back Wanham, and then Daniil Hunter is, is a free agent. He's going to get a massive extension from some team. I don't know whether it's going to be the Vikings, Dave, but it's going to be somebody. Uh, Marcus Davenport's going to be playing for somebody else. It won't be with the Vikings next year. And then you got Wanham. Are you bringing him back or not? I don't know. I don't know if Marcus Davenport plays. If, if you're the rest Anywhere. of the league and you're hearing stories from New Orleans and now you're hearing stories from Minnesota and you've seen – you know, you see the coach's press conference where KOC gets up there and goes, yeah, he's walking around just fine. He just doesn't want to, doesn't think he's ready to come off of high R. Other teams are going to see that and go, nah. Yeah, but if the price go, point. And Davenport won't like, care. He's made how many millions of dollars? Yeah, I, I still think. That um, you know, say he's not going to get thirty million next year. But if he got some team would say, "I'll send, I'll sign him for a one year, five year, and see if we can get 10, 15, you know, twelve games out of him." I can I can see that happening. Mm -hmm. um, but he won't be with the Vikings anyway, which means they're going to have to find somebody to, to put in that edge rusher position, whether it be uh, in that room. And I don't know who that's going to be right now. Uh, like, is Hunter going to be back? Davenport won't be back. We'll want him to be back. Uh, you've got Jones, and then. Carter and then not very much else. So, I, you know, I think Ed Rusher was going to be like something that the Quasi Dofamensa was going to address in early in the draft anyway, either first or second round. You see Jared Verse going to the Vikings in a lot of mock drafts, I think. Um, I, I think that this, again, Wanham's injury will increase that likelihood for the Vikings. And maybe they even double dip and go a couple of Ed Rushers in the draft in, in 2024. So no those idea. two... Those two injuries, uh, like Juan and TJ Augustin, uh, I think really alter the Vikings' offseason roster building plans. Um, and very unfortunate for both players and for the Vikings as well uh, for 2024. And, and that was your whole purpose behind this theme was these injuries now not only affect this season, but they affect next season as well. And what's going to happen in the offseason? As we all know, 
Uh, Daniil Hunter's a free agent. Davenport's a free agent, thankfully. Wanham's a free agent. We have no other edge rushers behind that other than Jones and Carter. Neither of those two have done anything that gets fans juiced up. And we know yes. a good defense needs good, decent edge rushers. You need to be able to pressure the quarterback. Edge rushers are part of that. Now, I could take a, a Wanham type who's had eight sacks this year and 38 or so pressures or whatever it was and deal with him if he can set the contain. You can deal with that and then get rush elsewhere. But we're just not going to have it. And on top of that, when we showed the picture of Brian Flores, <laughs> he may be a free agent this year. Correct. He may go off to someplace else. As much as the fans, we want him to stay and coach some more, make him, you know, give him bank, make him assistant head coach, whatever. He may go off somewhere. And if he goes off, how many of these free agent players are going to go with him? Daniel Hunter may. I know that's the worst case and it sounds horrible to fans, but it's quite the possibility. Harrison Smith may retire. He was talking about retiring last year. The only reason he stayed was because he wanted to play for Flores. Mm -hmm. If Flores walks, gets a job someplace else, gets his head coach gig, whatever, that may change, and next year's defense is suddenly, oh, my God, what are we going to do? And Quazy's going to have a whole lot of figuring out to do to make that right. Now, can you pick up defensive players in free agency? Yes, you can. Uh, but you also need to draft a bunch. As well as we've got other priorities in the draft that we'll get to yeah. after this season, as we know, quarterback being one of them. Yeah, and when you there's a number of areas you could look at. Well, the Vikings need you know need to add somebody here. They need to add somebody there. And 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 when you like running back, is it became a need after based on what we've seen this year? Uh, but tight end was not. Well, now tight end I think is. Uh, and that tomorrow's game, somebody else could get injured, hopefully not, mm -hmm. and add another need to, to the draft. And we still don't, we don't even have 10 draft picks in this draft uh, yet. So uh, it's not like we've got the old Spielman 15 draft picks where we can kind of take, <laughs> you know, throw, throw a few darts at a few positions. Uh, it, it's, that's just not where we're sitting. Um, I'd like our needs to be narrowed down to two or three. We could focus on those throughout the draft. That is not the way it's things are turning out with the season and the amount of injuries that the Vikings have had. Uh, Davy Change was saying uh, we, the the Wolves need to open the purse strings. I don't think the Wolves opening the purse strings is the issue. The issue has been our salary cap position the past two years as to why we've done the bargain you know bargain bin kind of things with Shopping. people like with Lowry with Davenport trying to get you know go. Uh, get guys on modest contracts, uh, only signing them for one or two years, but getting guys that we think have high upside. If, you know, if they stay healthy, if they play the way they should, they would be a huge bargain, and we'll deal with signing to a larger extension later. Um, and I think that's why we've been Quasi Dofa Mensa has been going that that route. And I agree. And uh, most of those have not panned out. And that's that's part of it. You're rolling dice yeah. on those type of players. So. Davenport's one of them, and it's unfortunate because when he plays, he's good. That True. brings us to theme three. The Vikings versus the Packers, <laughs> part two, hosted at U.S. Bank. Slides, Dave. Slides. Let's oh, have them. That's right. I was just enjoying the bottom graphic on it. Yeah, yeah. I'm just seeing that now, making it out. Woo, look at that injury report. <laughs> yeah. All right, I did this last night. If anything changed between now and then, like you said, uh, Troy Dye was put on IR. That's obviously changed. Um, Vikings, Byron Murphy, out. Speaking of starters. 
Yep. Jalen Naylor out. Could have used him with as a wide receiver. We get uh, Theo Jackson out. Great special teamer. Also hops in there on defense. Jaqueline Roy. Yes. I want to see more of him. He's out. My guess is that Lewisine will not be a will be dressed up tomorrow, and yeah. not in and not in a suit and tie, but in a Vikings uniform. Of uh, yes, Anthony Love stinks. Jay Giles, man. Anyways, we get to Jordan Addison. He's questionable ankle injury. Makai Blackman questionable. Hopefully, both of those guys play. They were limited. Troy Dye was was questionable until they stuck him on IR. So he's done. Packers. They need to be fined. The way they did this injury report. And I sent this to you. Yep. They have five doubtfuls. Most of which are starters. And why they are doubtful is that a bunch of them are on IR designated to return. And when you look at the report, there are some of them that did not practice all week. Not at all. Not a single day. They're doubtful. Some of them that practiced in full all week, and they still list them as doubtful. Okay. <laughs> uh, somewhat limited practice. That I could understand. Then you get to their questionables, as you can see there, and they have quite a few. And again, some of those... Did not practice all week. Some of them were full practice all week, and some of them were limited all week. And it's just, they were spamming the system, and it's garbage. That's why I don't like it. They're obviously Patriot. bullshitting. Hmm? We didn't put anybody on the injury report until they were designated to play. You know, they could be in the window, the IR return window, but we didn't until they're designated to play. I think that's crazy. Uh, Mary, you wonder if Cousins will be on the sideline? That's a good question. I wouldn't see why he wouldn't be. He was there last week. All right. Always we start with quarterbacks. Quarterbacks, generally 80% of the time, 95% of the time, somewhere in there to that range, the better quarterback wins the game. In this case... PFF does not have a power ranking for Jaron Hall yet because he hasn't played enough. However, on their rankings of 72 quarterbacks that have played this year, no minimum snaps, he ranks 26th, which surprised me. That was actually pretty good. Jordan Love's power ranking is 10. Same as Goff last week. A lot of his numbers were the same as Goff last week, which was weird. Speaking of those numbers, Jaron Hall has a PFF grade of 64.9. Not great, not terrible. Uh, just throw, just don't even look at those grades, Dave. The, they're, the amount they're of time not, they're, they're just, they don't mean anything. Now, he does beat Goff in two completions, his quarterback rating and his completion rating, which is, or beat Love, which I think is cool. I hope he keeps that up. But we'll find out. But otherwise, Jordan Love has the better ratings. When we get to offense versus defense, Vikings offense dropped a spot down to 29th per PFF. For Ooh. DVOA, they stayed the same at 21st. They actually went up one and pass and down one and run. Um, and then we get to Elias Sports Bureau, your box score stats. They're the ones that provide it for NFL.com, ESPN, CBS, everybody, blah, 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 newspapers, et cetera. They have us 10th in yards. We actually went up one. Uh, third in passing, thanks to that prolific passing of, believe it or not, Nick Mullins. 27th in rushing, dropped a little bit. 22nd in points. We've taken 39 sacks on the season. We are 30th in turnovers. And giveaways with a minus nine differential, we know that is what killed us all season long. Packers defense, however, they suck. They are ranked 27th by PFF. 
<coughs> pardon me, DVOA has them 30th overall, 30th against pass, and 25th against the run. Elias Sports Bureau looks at him a little bit better. 23rd in yards, 13th passing, 30th against the rush. So hopefully Ty Chandler has a good game tomorrow. And 17th on points. They have their 23rd in sacks. They have gotten 36. Gary, what do you mean what happened to the creed? That's a good thing. Uh, maybe they stopped playing it in the locker room. That may be part of the problem. As far as takeaways, their defense, their 25th was 16. Not terrible. Not horrible, but or the, not good. But anyways, we flipped the script. Vikings defense, 16th. They went down a little bit per PFF. Packers offense per PFF is ranked 11th. When we get to DVOA, Vikings defense stayed steady at number five. They're seventh against the pass and ninth against the run. Packers offense is 10th overall, fourth in the pass, and 19th in the run. So it's a, it's a closer matchup. We got bad on bad when it comes to our offense on their defense, and we got good on good when it comes to our defense versus their offense, relatively speaking. Elias Sports Bureau has us dropping a spot, 13th in yards, 17th against in passing, 9th in rushing, 10th on points, still top 10. We were, I think, 5 or 6 last week, so that was a significant drop. We are 12th when it comes to sacks. We have 42, believe it or not, and uh, we are 19th in takeaways with 21. Their offense is 17th in yards, 18th in passing, 18th in rushing, 11th in points. They're more productive. They're efficient. They uh, have taken 29 sacks. They're 7th in giveaways at only 16, and they have a zero differential. They have as many takeaways as they have giveaways. And for this game, the Vikings are favored by one, as when I looked last night, and the over-under is 43 and a half. Then we get to special teams. The bane of our existence so far this season. <laughs> they suck. Viking special teams dropped again. They're now 30th overall. But don't get too, you know, alarmed about that. They're going against the 27th ranked special teams in the Packers. They both stink. The only <laughs> place that the Vikings beat them is on punts and punt returns. And on both of those, we are below average. So it's, man. That is your slideshow for today. Catching you up on the stats of this game, which are almost meaningless because it's in the U.S. Bank. It's a home game. It's against a division rival that we all want to see beat. <laughs> because it's the Packers. It is. Um, when we did this, our first Packers um, Vikings game preview, Dave. Uh, the the reason I was really pretty bullish on the Vikings' chances of of beating the Packers at Lambeau, uh, a place where they often struggle, was because I thought the Vikings had a sizable advantage at the quarterback position with Kirk Cousins over Jordan Love. Well, two months later, that is no longer the case. <laughs> It's flipped, uh, and you got two teams going in opposite directions, and the Vikings are the ones going in the wrong direction. And a big reason why is because of quarterback play. Um, since and now, now the, again, Jordan Love gives the the Packers in this game a sizable advantage at quarterback. Um, you know, you know, back on October 29th. Uh, in that game, I, I don't think the Packers didn't have a first down on offense until like late in the first half. Um, Love missed on some throws. He and throughout that season, he'd been he'd been unable to complete long, you know, deep throws. The Packers didn't have a deep passing game at all. Uh, he missed on. He was uh, inaccurate. He was turning the ball over more than you would have liked. He didn't look confident. Uh, with what he was seeing or what he was doing in there, well, that's completely shifted since October 29th. Um, and like stats-wise, 
he's his completion percentage is at 62 and a half uh, 62.5 per, uh, percent completion percentage is a little bit lower than you would like in today's nfl but he's thrown for almost 3600 yards so far 27 tds 11 interceptions his stats are pretty there was a graphic that went up last week or the week before saying his stats are almost mirror to what aaron Rodgers were his first season as a starter which, uh, which is packers fans all giddy yes it, exactly uh it does uh but i guess the, the point is like love is like not the same quarterback he was october 29th and the Packers are not the same team they were on October 29th either. Um, well, and I want and, to highlight what Andrew said earlier. Flores had his head spinning yeah. in that first game. We'll see if that happens this time. That's right, yes. Um, with the with that team from Wisconsin, with their offensive, with, with Love playing well uh, like he has been, uh, which is a big turnaround for what it was. The other thing is, which is kind of funny about the – Green Bay offense is that they don't have that one wide receiver that you got to focus on and say, if we stop him, you know, our defense is in good shape. Uh, they don't have that guy like Justin Jefferson, but they've got a bunch of guys who are contributing. So it almost makes them tougher to, to defend in a way because any of their guys could have a big game, uh, it, it, you know, and you can't really focus on one player and say, uh, if we stop him, we're good. Um, so that's an interesting thing and something that the Vikings are going to have to deal with. Uh, one guy that really has emerged lately is this guy, Jaden Reed, who's kind of like a poor man's Tyree kill in, in my mind where, you know, they, he's really quick, really, ju- you know, great moves, great at making yards after the catch. The, the Packers have been getting him the ball, getting, trying to get him the ball in a variety of ways, jet sweeps, handoffs, reverses, uh, that, you know, they give him the, you know, like the, getting him on the short passes and also having him run the regular route tree, but they try to get the ball in his hands a lot now. And he's got a real knack for when he, of getting, uh, making more yards than you'd expect when he gets that, the ball in his hands. So he's a guy that Brian Flores and the Vikings defense, they're going to have to watch and account for tomorrow. And they've got to be able to limit his explosive plays. And and when they get a chance to put him, bring him down, they've got to bring him down. Um, cause he's a big part of their offense right now. Um, and and speaking of the Vikings defense, uh, there you yeah, go. Well, <laughs> Dollar yeah. Tree, Tyree Kill. Yeah. But you know, speaking of the Vikings, Vikings defense, like again, um, um, Byron Murphy out this game. Uh, McK- Mackay Blackman maybe is questionable, might be out. So if those two guys, we know Murphy won't be playing. Mackay Blackman is iffy. If Blackman can't play, then your starting corners against a much improved Green Bay offense and passing game could be Caleb Evans, who was benched mm-hmm. last week because of poor play, and Andrew Booth Jr. Uh, so that could be an issue. <laughs> and could be an issue. The nickel. Yeah, and, and Theo Jackson isn't playing either, and he's yeah. a guy that they bring in as a, an extra defensive back and a coverage guy as well. Uh, so we are shorthanded, like you were, you referenced earlier. Going to be interesting to see. You don't have Wanham now, so Patrick Jones is going to have to play more. You might be down to not really your optimum corners that you want to play uh, against. Uh, so uh, be really interesting. How is Brian Flores going to generate pressure? How is he going to be able to uh, you know, create the pressure uh, like was mentioned earlier, where he had jo- Jordan Love's head spinning in that first game. Mm-hmm. Like, how is he going to make Love the unconfident, jittery, uh, inaccurate quarterback he was from the start of the season to October 29th instead of the guy we've been seeing since then who's been really accurate, making good plays, making good decisions. And all season long, it's been tough to sack Jordan Love. He is a guy who is very mobile gets out of pressure pretty well. Uh, so, you know, a lot of uh, issues, especially for Vikings defense that is struggling a little bit lately, as you know, giving up some late leads, gave up 30 points against Detroit, very good offense, but they did, could not get off the field against Detroit. Jared Goff found all kinds of holes in the zone coverage that Brian Flores has been running with his, his scheme. So a lot of questions that the Vikings defensively are going to have to answer tomorrow if we see the Jordan love that we've been seeing lately. Um, the good news for the Vikings is that on the other side of the ball, like you said, uh, the that team from Wisconsin's defense is not very good. Uh, they've been giving up lots of yardage, lots of points. Uh, they're without their top corner, Jair Alexander. He hasn't played much this year anyway, but 
him not being there should be a plus for the Vikings. And we've got Justin Jefferson back. And in the last two games at the U.S. Bank Stadium, he has just murdered the Packers. 17 catches, 358 yards, four TDs. Like, that's monstrous production by him in those two games. So he's back at the bank. The question is, can Jaron Hall connect with him that way like Kirk Cousins was? I would say that's uh, a big, big question. For that matter. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Um, Well, yeah. I agree. So the The problem is for the Packers, I didn't mean this in that one, is this guy right here. Yeah, defensive defensive uh, coordinator Joe Barry is not has been uh, most Packer fans want to want to see him gone. They wanted to see him gone last year or even maybe the year before. He's still around and still not uh, piloting a very good Green Bay defense, even though they've got some talent there that you think would make them a pretty good defense. Um, but they haven't been. There's and, rumors that he may be fired after this game, depending hmm. on how it um, goes. On how it goes. I think you know, outside of Justin Jefferson, questionable how big of an impact if he can have as big an impact as he's had the past couple of years at the bank with the quarterback that he's going to be playing with. But I think some guys that needed that I think you got to look at to have a big game are one Josh Oliver at tight end. Although I heard that the Vikings are going to use Johnny Munt as the pass catching guy, which seems very odd to me. But like I, I think like to me Oliver, it's, it's probably going to be a mixture of all three. Yeah. Oliver needs to be like a, a, a good secondary dump off option for check down option for Jaron Hall, break a couple of tackles. He's got to be a guy in the, 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 the line of scrimmage to the eight yard pass line of scrimmage area where he's got to be make available and be a, an option and a threat and, and take some heat off of Hall and, and be some kind of a dependable, um, again, secondary dump off auction option for the Vikings offense to help Hall a little bit. The other guy, I think he's going to, have to play a big role is KJ Osborne a bit of a forgotten guy but the, the, but just when you think that Osborne is like worthless <laughs> has no role in the offense then he'll have I think that's where and when he really so gets back and, and thrives last week against Detroit we saw what what Osborne could do when you get him involved in the game and, and throw him a few passes he had He's a very a good game wide receiver three he gets yeah. about 500 yeah. yards a season and he comes up at the end of the season making important stop catches. And that's that's what he is. And maybe he has, like you said, a big game tomorrow. Well, he, he's going to need to, especially if Addison isn't in there. Um, and his best game this year was against that team from Wisconsin in Lambeau. He had eight catches for 99 yards and had a hell of a game in that game. Um, I think somebody mentioned that. Powell is a, is a is a weapon. Yes, like Powell's going to have to. If Addison can't play, Powell's uh, Powell's role is going to increase. And we have seen, like he was my unsung hero a few weeks ago. He's going to have to continue that role if Addison doesn't play. Uh, so Osborne, Oliver, Keys. I think another big key is just pass protection because again, Joe Barry. I think you're going to see him try to do some of the things that Aaron Glenn tried to do last week, where uh, trying to create simulated pressure, uh, blitzing corners, safeties, in, in, and trying to get a free rusher at Jaron Hall. So going to be very important for the Vikings starting offensive line, I think, to, you know, Good communication, you know, make the right choices on where you're sliding the protection. So you and if there is a free blitzer, then it's going to be big for the running backs, Ty Chandler, Alexander Madison, CJ Ham, who's ever in there, to win that block and like paste the free defensive back safety who's who's rushing. And that didn't always happen last week against Detroit. Um, so that is a big thing. But in the end, Dave. This is the Vikings' offensive success, like it always does. It comes down to the guy who's under center, and that's Jaron Hall in this game. Mm-hmm. And we talked the first first uh, first segment, the first theme about how you know I agree with this decision. I'm supportive of it 100. percent It had to be done, and it was done, and I'm glad to see it. But we got to be honest as Viking fans of what <laughs> we could be getting ourselves into here with Jaron Hall playing. It, it, I took a look just out of, uh, out of curiosity of uh, the, the quarterbacks who were picked in the range last uh, April where Hall was late fourth round, fifth round. So, and their first starts and how they did. Well, Aiden O'Connell uh, completed 61% of his passes. I think he was 24 for 39. 
Uh, he 238 yards, no touchdown passes, one interception. He was sacked seven times. They lost 24 to 17. I think it was to the Chargers. Um, you look at Clayton Toon, picked in the fifth round a couple of picks later before Jaron Hall. He was uh, like 11 for something. He threw for 55, 58 yards, 55% <laughs> completion percentage, um, no touchdown passes, two interceptions, was sacked seven times. They lost to the Browns 27 to nothing. He has not been seen since. <laughs> and then Dorian, <laughs> Dorian, Dorian Thompson Robinson picked one selection after Toon, again before Darren Hall. Uh, he was 14 for 29. He had a 48% com- uh, 0.3 completion percentage, 148 yards, something like that. Two touchdown passes, one interception. He was sacked six times. I think the Browns lost uh, 28 to 14, something along. They lost to, to Denver, not a close one. Uh, actually, he got surpassed by Flacco. Yes, he did. Uh, and if you look at even the highly drafted guys, Marcus Stroud, Bryce Young, um, Anthony Richardson, Will Levis. Levis is the only rookie in his first start who led the team to a victory. Uh, and uh, he had the best start out of all those guys. So I would say you know, Stroud's look, having the best season out of all those guys. Oh, he is, yes. But even Stroud's first start was not as good as Levis's, and the Texans didn't win that game. Um, but you know, what I'm getting at here is that uh, we're very enthu- you know we're excited to see Hall uh, we're to see what he can do you know he's the new kid on the block it's it's not his first start but basically it is because if he can make it through it healthy because you can't learn much from two series against Atlanta that tells us nothing but right. we got to be ready for things to get ugly Sunday night against <laughs> against that team from Wisconsin because if you've we've seen what similar quarterbacks drafted and even before him have done, they haven't done very well. And it's likely that Hall's going to get sacked a fair bit. He probably will struggle to generate explosive plays through the air. We're probably going to see a lot of check downs and dump offs on third and long that don't accomplish much. He might make poor decisions and commit as many costly turnovers as Mullins and Dobbs did. But that's what you signed up for when you asked for Jaron Hall to be the starter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, instead of Dobbs and Mullins, that was a distinct possibility. And he might even play worse than those two, but we got to be okay with it. And I am okay with it, but just when it happens, if it happens on Sunday night, I don't want to hear people come in and say at halftime, put in no Mullins. KLC has got to put in Mullins. I mean, come on, like at least stick to your guns. And if you wanted Mullins five weeks ago, now he's in there, stick to your guns, even if things don't go as well as you're hoping. And they probably won't. <laughs> no, they probably won't. The only benefit I can see is uh, I'm hearing rumors that the, the Packers are quietly trying to tank as well for draft position. So if they're playing that and we already know, they're probably going to get rid of Coach Barry. It's... It may be both teams, you know, trying not to not trying not to win versus trying to win. So it could be one of those ugly games. We never know. Now it should be rocking. We're talking. It's Sunday night, last game of the week. I don't. There's. I don't think there's a Monday night game. It should be the last game of the week. Last, literally the last game. We know. Football fans like to start tailgating at about seven, eight o'clock in the morning, right? And they're doing <laughs> breakfast and whatever and they grill. I would never they, make it to the game if yeah. I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Man, and then they start grilling and stuff. And of course, all the time drinking. That's normally okay for a nooner, but this sucker <laughs> is prime yeah. time. They are going to be schnockered. By the time they even get into the stadium, and it's going to be a wild event because it's New Year's Eve, right? So it's going to be absolutely rocking. Halls, everybody's going to be hyped up to see Hall. It's going to be good. It's against the dreaded Packers, which, you know, you'll hear no pack, no, and all that sort of stuff. And I uh, I don't hope Minnesota fans didn't sell off half the stadium to those fans. But... Um, you know there's going to be some in this in the crowd, but it's going to be rocking, and everybody's going to be absolutely probably lit and having a great time. 
And it, no matter who wins afterwards, especially if the Vikings win, the stadium will empty out a little bit after 10, 11 o'clock, right into the bar scenes of downtown Minneapolis for New Year's Eve. It's going to be <laughs> wild. It will be. And last week I felt, Dave, that the, the Vikings, the, the bank, was actually like a real home field advantage for the Vikings, even though they, again, didn't play very well and lost. Like, you saw multiple times where Detroit, uh, like, either had to call a timeout uh, because they couldn't get the play in or couldn't hear the play, or they got penalized a couple of times for the clock running out, which is something we haven't seen or I haven't noticed happen this year at all at home games at the bank, where the opposing team seemed to have trouble getting the plays in on time uh, because of the crowd noise. Um, back at Metrodome, the Vikings had a home field advantage every game because I don't know, maybe it was just me, but it seemed like it was louder in the Metrodome, way louder. The fans, that place really did have a home field advantage. And the bank to me doesn't seem like it's quite that way uh, as the it Metrodome. Can be, but yeah. it doesn't, I, I think it's just a different crowd. Russell, yeah. I'm not sure which uh, hall print you're talking about. Russell, they're all awesome. So, <laughs> 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 yeah, take your pick. You're not going to lose. Um, but it, it's going to be fun, and, it, and I think it's the crowd. I mean, the loudest U.S. Bank's ever been was the miracle, right? And that just brought down the roof. They can get that loud, and that and the stadium's designed to help bounce sound back in. You mm-hmm. know, the Metrodome helped. Any any enclosed building is going to help with sound. Also, they were accused of, you know, pumping sound in, but it's, I don't know. I said, it's almost, it's almost the, the fans and the crowd and the whole deal. You know, we haven't been super excited um, about which one it is. All right, Russell, I know which one you're talking about. Uh, contact me somewhere. Uh, private message either on Twitter or whatever, and I'll shoot it to you. Um, Yogi's here as well. Jaden Daniels, please, in the draft. <laughs> Yogi, we'll get into the draft. We'll early sure. for that. But, uh, I appreciate the sentiment. Yeah, as I'm sure as soon as the season's over, we will get into the draft. I Hopefully not before, but we shall see. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you, uh, Justin. Justin. That cannot be. I'm in there. there. I'd heard they could, and I'm glad that's the case. But it should be good. Um, And while we're bringing up draft and Jaden Daniels, Yogi, I wish he had a few more pounds on him. But otherwise, yes, there's uh, we're at week 17. We've only got one more after this, and that's traveling to Detroit. And that's who knows. But... As I told a Steelers fan today, the Vikings can finish 2-15 and 15 on a season as long as those two wins are against that team from Wisconsin. It'll be a partial success. And so I hope tomorrow we do the sweep. Which would be the first one since 2017, I believe. Oh, good knowledge, good knowledge. Oh, good knowledge. Good, <laughs> Justin, the fact checker. Good, Justin, I appreciate it. Um, any last words there, buddy? you have any predictions on tomorrow? Uh, <laughs> uh, again, with, with the, the quarterback situation, I'm just not feeling very good about the Vikings' chances of winning this one. Uh, I can't pick them uh, all over love um, in this case and with the injuries we have. But, hey, um time to you know again like we did against san francisco i didn't give us much of a chance then and we had kirk cousins um so uh surprise me vikings uh play inspired don't turn the ball over and you know hey uh i think our chances will be a lot better that way but however it goes like the vikings the vikings can't seem to they don't lose easy they don't win as easy so it seems like it's probably going to be a one, score. one score last possession game like it always has been this entire season, except the last time we played the Packers, our Mm -hmm. only game that wasn't by a game decided by one score. But um, 
like I, I don't want to go on too long because because I thank a lot of the people who've who've been able to suffer through me for the past hour and a bit. But uh, I saw an interesting article, Kevin Seifert this week talking about uh, quarterbacking and how there were some good stats in there about uh, how Kevin O'Connell has not changed his offense no matter who the quarterback has been this year. Uh, and I think that's something that we brought up. We brought it up when Josh Jobs was running the team. And like, are you going to change the? You can't just be a drop back team of Josh Jobs. You got to take advantage of his mobility. You got to use plays that that you know the run pass option that provide the threat of him running. Kevin O'Connell never really did that. The Vikings are still passing as much now as they did when Kirk Cousins was a quarterback. You know, they're, they're averaging one less pass per game than they were with Kirk Cousins. So it's basically the same. Uh, so I don't think we're going to see like Hall is is pretty mobile. He's a different quarterback than Nick Mullins, but I don't think the offense is going to be any different um, yeah. with Aaron Hall in there. And to me, that is a you know something that probably Kevin O'Connell has been questioned about and will continue to be questioned about because early in the game against the Detroit, we saw that first drive. They used misdirection and getting Mullins out of the pocket, and you you ripped right up the field. And scored a touchdown, did it pretty easily. Now you can't run bootlegs all the time, but it seemed like we didn't it worked well. Why would you stop doing it when it worked well? Like <laughs> and I, I think have no idea. Kind of, I think that's the kind of game planning that you're you would want to use with Jaron Hall in there. But will we see it or not? I'm thinking you might see it in the first drive and then it'll go away and it'll just be the the usual offense that we run. How successful that'll be, I don't know. Well, folks, we're already planning our postseason uh, topics, and one of them will be evaluating the coaches. And I'm sure that'll go into that. So, hey, all I've got is tomorrow is New Year's Eve. One, we're going to have a great day of football. No worries all the way up until prime time when we play. So that should be fun. I want you to be safe, be smart. If you do partake in adult beverages tomorrow night, make sure you have a ride scheduled or provided or something that you're not driving. Don't be one of the statistics on the evening and don't be an amateur. So with that, we wanted to wish you all, and I forgot to post this, let me switch screens real quick. There was one slide. This was the slide you were wanting. Um, but there was one more slide that Darren had me do, and then he forgot to mention it, but it applies. If you didn't hear us last week, belated Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of you. And thank you for watching. And what do we say, Darren? We say, Skull Vikings, baby. Beat the Skull. Packers. <laughs> oh, yes. Skull Vikings. Like, subscribe, and ring the bell. And rate us on your favorite podcast aggregator. Darren and Dave, thank you for watching this episode of Two Old Bloggers. We look forward to seeing you on every show on the new Vikings First and Skull. You can find our podcasts as part of the Fans First Sports Network. Sports takes for the fan, from the fan. Skull, everybody! Skull!